what you see up on the screen here uh, in the actual photograph, you can see that whoever took it was a little bit shaky. I've never, I don't think I've seen one except maybe one time while my dad and I were fishing out here by the Mississippi River. We'd been camping out for two or three nights. And a light came over from the Illinois side of the river, very, very bright light, shone down on the river. Um, I was thinking at the time it, it might have been a helicopter. I asked my dad, Dad, what is that? I don't know. It flew about halfway across the river, shined a light on the river, shined a light on the bank, shined a light on us, and then just left. And I've always wondered in my mind what that was, what it, what it was we saw, because if it was a helicopter, you can actually probably hear a helicopter before you can see the thing, they're very loud. But we didn't hear anything that sounded like a helicopter. So it was always a question in my mind what it was that I saw. I've been fascinated by UFOs. This particular picture here, there's actually, if you type in, uh, let me make sure I get this right, a TR3B. Does that sound familiar to some of you? Who in here reads studies and looks up UFOs? All right, good deal. Uh, this actually is a what they call a TR3B. I don't know what that stands for, but if you type that in at Google Images, you'll find this picture along with several others. It's leaked out of uh, the United States Navy. There was one of our naval ships out to sea, and at night for several weeks, this American Navy ship was being shadowed or being followed by an entire fleet of these triangular-shaped UFOs. One guy actually used uh, the United States Army, Navy, Air Force. They have some of the best toys in the world to play with. He actually used one of their night vision cameras to take uh, video of the shaped UFOs that were flying around this naval ship. The film was leaked. The Pentagon obviously didn't want that out. But now that it's out and everybody's seeing it, they're scrambling to come up with something of what it probably was. If you remember back in May, some of these guys testified before Congress. And I guarantee you some of them were just making up stories of and trying to say that they were anything except vehicles or things that were not from this world. Uh, and I almost forgot this picture as well. Uh, I have a pastor friend who lives out to, well, he's preached here, Brother Wayne Dinwiddie. Uh, he pastors a church out toward Lake of the Ozarks. And uh, I've been with him in his church. He's got a great church out there. His cousin, if I get this story right, his cousin, they were traveling through Colorado. They were driving in a place where they could see the mountains. So they took a, somebody, I guess, took a, their phone, their camera, stuck it out the window and took a picture of all these nice, pretty mountains in Colorado. They didn't know at the time what it was that they had taken a snapshot of. When they got to looking at the pictures later on, I guess on their home computer or whatever, they noticed that there was something in the clouds. And so they zoomed in the picture. And this is what they saw when they highlighted the picture a little bit. You can see the clouds are actually being pulled upwards by whatever circular object this is in the sky, the clouds are being pulled upward. You see lights all in a row circling whatever this is. Now I can tell you as far as I know, our United States Air Force, Navy, Army doesn't have a ship that looks like this, that can fly, let me go back here to this picture, at that altitude. 
A few months ago, we had a man here. Him and his wife came. They, they visited us. He was a Gulf War veteran times three. He had done several tours. He was a, you could tell he was a gung-ho army guy. He loved doing what he did. And I showed him this picture, and I asked him, in your opinion, how big do you think this thing is? He looked at the, he looked at the object there, and it's, you can tell it's beyond the mountains. And he looked at the close-up, and he said, if, if I were to give you a ballpark figure of just how big around this thing is, I'm guessing at least, a thousand meters in diameter. A thousand meters, a meter is roughly three feet. So you're talking about something that is anywhere from 3,000 to 3,500 feet big flying in the sky over Colorado. It is a real object. You can see that it's pulling the clouds up along with it and so on. Uh, I want to ask this question. I did this in Arkansas, down at a church I like to go to, and I said, has anybody ever seen anything strange, you know, like lights in the sky or anything like that? Nobody raised their hand. So then I did this presentation, and I showed them from the Bible what they were, what God says they are, what the Bible says they are. And then I got done, I said, does anybody have any questions? Hands all over the place. You know, Brother Mike, I saw these lights outside my farm one day. And there was at least a dozen people that said they'd seen a UFO. They just didn't want to say it in front of anybody. So I want to ask you this morning, has anybody here ever seen what they think could possibly be a UFO? Wow! Matthew, I know your story. Ron, have you told me yours, Ron, Sandy? By the way, I like the shirts. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I talked to my mom. She said I could tell this. I've told this before, but um, was this before or after I was born? After. Well, see, you probably came home and told me when I was one, and I re had it in my mind all this time. We used to live down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Pine Bluff, Arkansas is nothing but farmland. It's lowland. It's in the Mississippi uh, lowland area right across from the Mississippi River. We lived on the river side of the levee. Remember next to a cotton field. We had neighbors that my dad and him were good friends. My mom and his wife were good friends. They were coming home one night late. And just before they reached the levee, there's a lake that's there. I, I've seen the lake like on Google Maps, so I can picture it in my mind. But as they're going by this lake, they both look out and they see a glowing saucer-shaped object hovering over this lake. Naturally, this car slows down. They're both looking at this thing, and as they're looking at it, immediately the thing went whoop and was gone. Did I tell it right? Good deal. Last of what, about five, ten seconds maybe? Wasn't very long at all. So my mom sees me coming home with all these UFO books from the school library, books on aliens and Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and UFOs and all these years, she never says a word to me about it till a couple of years ago. Well, I'm thankful that she did. Now, I'm going to read to you a story. Uh, I think the reason why these gentlemen have come from Berlin was last year... I believe God laid it on my heart to go attend the Mutual UFO Network Symposium in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now this is the first UFO conference I've ever been to in my life. And I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, but as you can see, we took that banner, had it made up, and I put up a website just before we went down there, ufopastor.com. 
And I've made several DVDs on this subject, and I thought, well, we'll go out there and we'll just hand out free DVDs to everybody. People, when they go to conferences and home shows and things like that, they like to get free stuff. So we went with all these free DVDs. And uh, while we were there last year, there was a German reporter there. And he was going to the different booths and so on, and he saw ours. And it clearly, you know, that's, we had, that was the banner we have there, ufopastor.com. And he was talking, I think, to my wife and a couple of the ladies that were helping out with the table and found out that we were a Protestant church and we were at a UFO conference. And the, in his mind, the two didn't click. I was inside listening to one of the speakers. My wife sent me a text and said, you need to come out here and talk to this guy. So I came out and met him. He was a reporter, and I, I'm not sure exactly what all he writes for, but I do know that he writes at least part-time for a German paranormal website. Paranormal deals with anything supernaturally related like ghosts, uh, cryptid creatures, things like Bigfoot, so on, and UFOs. And he, he tells me, he says, I grew up Catholic, and he said, uh, you're obviously a Protestant church, and what, what sort of denomination are you? I said, well, we're Baptist. And he said, I'm curious, what is a Baptist church doing at a UFO conference? And I told him what we were doing there, and he said, do you mind if I interview you? And I said, no, I would love that. So we went into a private room. He set a recorder down, and he, we probably talked for maybe an hour, hour, 15 minutes, something like that. And I just felt perfect liberty to share everything that I could, everything that I knew, everything that I knew that the Bible said uh, about UFOs, about aliens, and so on. And uh, he thanked me for it, and he gave me the, his card, and he said that he would let me know uh, when the article was written up, and so on. Now, in America, if somebody's going to do write an article on you about UFOs or some news agency is going to bring their camera crew and they're going to film you talking about UFOs, I guarantee you somebody is going to make you look like an idiot. They're going to make you look crazy. It'll make you look like you believe in, like you're some weirdo. When he wrote the article, I was amazed at, at how he wrote it. He, was, he literally represented me and our church and what we believe, or at least what I believe, in an in a outstanding way. Well, the next thing I know, I'm getting contacted by these guys here from, I think it was Katerina at first that contacted me, wanted to know if I would be interested in being part, you guys are working on a documentary, and if I would be, wanted to be a part of that. Well, I'm not going to turn that down. And so I think that's how all of that started. God moved it in my heart to go to this UFO conference to do what we did. We get written about. It ends up, I think, on German radio. Somebody associated with this company heard it. And they've traveled all the way from Germany to here to hear our side of the story. Now, one thing I know about the whole UFO phenomenon is that everybody, it's like politics and religion and a nose. Everybody's got one. And some of them smell pretty good and some of them don't smell pretty good. So I'm going to give you what I believe is God's version of this. So did you bring your Bible? Let me show you a few more pictures while you're getting your Bibles ready. You'll probably... Uh, I don't know where to first turn to. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm sure we'll start there. Ezekiel chapter 1, Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4. Anyway, we'll get there in a little bit. Here's another picture of somebody took outside of a farm. They magnified it. It looks like a bell-shaped UFO. Um, here's another set of pictures. Uh, different saucer-shaped craft. This picture was actually taken back, I think, in the early 50s. Uh, out, this is from America outside of, a, outside of a factory. Four glowing discs. Uh, here's another one. 
You can see the saucer-shaped craft there surrounded by five glowing objects and so on. Uh, here's one um, where the UFO is sort of that, that typical characteristic uh, UFO shape, the, the flying saucer. In fact, does anybody know where the phrase flying saucer came from? Uh, there was a man who was a fire, a forest fire equipment salesman, Arnold. He around Mount Rainier, and he sees nine of these, and they're actually not shaped uh, like a saucer, or they're not shaped like a frisbee, or anything like that. They're plan form. You'll have to look that up to see what they look like. But anyway. He spots these things and he reports them. The news obviously gets in touch with him and asks him what he saw. And he said, what I saw was these things were flying through the air. His estimation of their speed was somewhere around 3,000 miles an hour. That's fast. And he said the way they were moving, Chris, was it looked like if you took a saucer and skipped it across the water, and he said that's how they were moving. Well, that's how the news picked up on that idea, was that they were thinking he said that they were flying saucers. That's where they came up with that idea. All right, now, let me introduce you to what the Bible calls the gods. I believe that there is us humans living on this world, obviously animals, people have dogs, cats, I've got a part of a deer head in my office, so we have animals that live on this world, we have humans that live on this world, and we know from the scriptures that as far as God's creation is concerned, there is a realm that is above us, above what we are able to see or hear or feel or touch and it is the realm and this goes all the way back if you if you look at any civilization in history to my knowledge there has never ever been a civilization at any time in history that rose up that didn't believe in any type of deity whatsoever in other words, it doesn't matter if it was in uh, the Middle East, Africa, A uh, China, Japan, Russia, the, the native tribes of America, the First Nations up in Canada, uh, the native tribes in Central and South America. They have always believed in a realm that was superior to human beings and they were called the gods. Most. Most of these civilizations believed in multiple gods and many of them believed that there was one superior God. That is what we as Christians believe. We believe that there is one God whom the Bible calls the Most High God. Meaning that that God is in charge of everybody and everything. Somebody say amen. Now, here's what God said about those lesser gods. Lesser than he is, higher than us. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 2. To be found among you within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods. See, God had already told in the Ten Commandments. He said, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And that's what I believe about God. Our God, the Most High God, says, worship me and me alone. Do not worship any other gods and have no other gods before me. So God is reiterating that here. He says, if I find out, verse 3, that they have gone and served other gods and worshiped them... Either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven. Now notice what he's saying here. He's picking out objects that we know are in the sky. We know there's the sun out there. Go outside and take a look at it. But just for a second. Go out at night, you'll see the moon. Go out at night, you'll see the stars. And believe it or not, and I'm sure you believe this, that people, millions of people throughout all the generations of mankind 
They have actually chosen to worship the literal object of the sun, the object of the moon, and the object of all the stars. They've worshipped those. And God said in verse 4, And it be told thee, that the, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. God was pretty serious about this, wasn't he? He said, do not worship any of these lesser gods. Now, why would God do that? Why would God be so serious about that? Let me ask you this question. When you were growing up, was there ever somebody that your mom or your dad told you Son or daughter, so-and-so's house, don't ever go down to their house. Does that sound familiar? If they invite you in, don't you ever go in their house. Now, that probably made you like me. I want to go in their house and find out why I'm not supposed to go in there. God is telling us, don't worship these other gods, don't serve them, don't get involved with them. Why would God tell us that? Probably because God knows how dangerous they are. You see, one of, and this is what I explained to the reporter last year. I said, we believe as Christians that there are good gods, with a little g, angels. And there are very dark, evil, bad ones. We believe that devils like that actually cause people to go into schools and shoot up little children and teachers. Can I hear somebody say amen? That's why God said, I don't want you messing with them. Then he said um, in Deuteronomy 13, 13, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Now, I'll just, I'll just put it very simple for you. I believe that these aliens that everybody keeps talking about, it's interesting that some of them look like serpents and reptiles. They call them the reptilians, the draconians. And isn't that interesting that there is a group of devils in the Bible that look exactly like that? Some of them they call the, the tall whites or the Nordics because they look like people from Norway, Switzerland. Hitler's Aryan race, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, superior to all the other gods, human-like in their form. And isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us that there are angels who look just like that? So it occurred to me that for just about every class of alien that I've ever studied, I could just about take you to place in the Bible and show you, well, this is who they are right here. So God says, if anybody, no matter what they call them, gods, aliens, there's some people who say, I'm a devil worshiper, I worship Satan. God says, if anybody wants to lead you in that direction, don't let them do it because they're dangerous. Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof it, with the edge of the sword. God said, I don't want you messing with those gods. Deuteronomy 32, they sacrificed. Un Notice how God puts these two words together. God's going to take the word devil and identify it with the word God with a little g. Deuteronomy 32, 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, capital G. To gods, little g, whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So God, in this one verse, has associated these gods by calling them devils. 
So if it makes you uncomfortable for me to say the word alien, I believe aliens are in the Bible. I believe in aliens. I believe people see aliens. People are abducted by aliens. People are taken by aliens. If that makes you uncomfortable, it, what if I say it like this? I believe in devils. I believe devils are evil. I believe devils take over people. I believe devils do bad things to people. If I say it like that, then it sounds more Christian, doesn't it? Sounds more religious. But what I'm telling you is, I'm saying the exact same thing. Amen. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league, which means no treaty, no contract, no covenant, Make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides. And their gods, their gods, their devils, their aliens, their grays, their tall whites, their draconians, their gods shall be a snare unto you. And I, listen, I've been to two UFO conferences, Las Vegas last year and then Denver, Colorado this year. And I can tell you, there's a lot of people at these places that have been drawn in and snared by these gods, by these aliens. They worship them and they want them to come down to be the saviors of this world. Now, anything that goes up must come down. Psalm 82, 6. I've said, you're gods and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. It was that verse. Uh, Ron and Sandy. Has everybody seen Ron's t-shirt? If you've seen Ron's t-shirt, you've seen Sandy's t-shirt. I said one time, why are you both wearing the same shirt? And they said, they're not. They're two different shirts. He has his on, I have mine on. Roswell. What is Roswell all about? Supposedly a ship, an alien ship, crashed there outside of Roswell. The Roswell Army Air Base, 1947, July, went out to investigate. They had permission by the Pentagon to release the story to all the newspapers that said, we have captured an alien flying saucer. And then the day after that, they had orders to get rid of that story and replace it with something else. But they captured one. Now, that being said, and I've read a lot of books about it, I've heard about it, seen a lot of documentaries about it, so on and so on and so on. But with me, if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist. And my thing is, if these UFOs and their, their pilots, if they are of the spiritual realm... Number one, how can they die when the gods themselves are immortal? Number two, how does an angel crash? And I never could, I could not reconcile that until one night, one o'clock in the morning on a Thursday night, the Holy Ghost gives me this scripture and I knew it. Psalm 82, God said, I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. So at Roswell, we hear that three of the four aliens that were on that ship, three of them died. One of them survived and lived until about 1952, 1953. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. The word princes the word prince in the Bible is related to Ephesians 6. Principalities is what we wrestle against. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So a prince in the Bible is a spirit. And God just told you in these two verses that the spirits can and will and have fallen out of heaven and God has taken away their immortality and they have died just like men 
In Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as that cloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. According to the Bible, stars in the Bible are a representation of angels. Or I could say it the, the other way. Angels are a representation of the stars of heaven. The Bible calls them the heavenly host. When Jesus was born... And the shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Lo, the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Amen! A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts was there what does the bible mean by that a large group of angels stood with that one angel and they began to glorify god saying glory to god in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men you see that's the christianity that if you are a christian that's the christianity you ought to be a part of is that you want what god wanted what god sent the angels to say Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Why does Russia have to war with the Ukraine? Why do some nations just constantly have to fight other nations and kill not just soldiers but men, women, and children? Why can't we just have this religion of peace and goodwill toward all men? Somebody say amen. The stars of, but in verse 13, the stars of heaven, these wouldn't be the good angels, would they? They're the bad ones. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Revelation 12 tells us why and how these angels or these stars, these bright, shiny objects, why they fell from heaven. In Revelation 12, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Who's that dragon? Who is it? I wanted more people to say it. That would give Satan, he's the dragon. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth these are the gods the devils the bible calls them evil angels some people call them fallen angels but that's what they are and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born and there was a war in heaven in verse 7 michael you've heard of the angel michael the archangel and his angels which are the good angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels now let me tell you a little side story some things that i've read and some things that i know out of all of those ufo books that i brought home from the school library plus scores of other books that i've read about ufos aliens alien abductions which i believe in and in some of the abduction stories, the abductees were told by the aliens that the various alien races are at war with another alien race. And what you just read here in the Bible is God's version of their story. And God, I trust God's version over theirs. And what they've told some of their abductees is, is that we're not doing so well in the war. We need to change ourselves and change humanity to help us fight this war. That is Revelation 19 in what the Bible calls 
the battle of Armageddon. The last battle that takes place before Christ comes, we believe, establishes his kingdom for a thousand years on this earth. So it says, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. They're falling to the earth. Just like what we read, remember back in Psalm 82, I've said, you're gods, but all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. That is exactly, Psalm 82 is connected right with Revelation chapter 12. So now, hopefully, you're starting to get a picture of what all this UFO alien thing is about. Now, I've done just a brief, brief, that only took, what, an hour? That's brief for me. Just a brief study of what the gods are according to the Bible. But what do these gods look like? Um, yeah, here it is. I was at Sam's last week and saw this. And it's teaching about the ancient religions. And, and by the way, how these ancient religions are all coming back. And it gave various old religions, Anglo-Saxon paganism. Uh, it talked in here about some of the Norse, the Nordic gods. Has anybody here ever heard of a god named Thor? The Loki? And how do you know these gods? Yeah, they made movies about them, didn't they? Yeah. And another one. There's apparently another one out now. Only there's a woman Thor. And I'm going, there's not a woman Thor. Anyway. Some of the old Viking religions. Some of the Egyptian. Some of the ancient Roman religions. Then you have the, the, the Greek religions. And the Greek believed that there were 12 gods who lived on Mount Olympus. And I think I mentioned this last night. Isn't it interesting that the Greeks had 12 gods? God selected the 12 patriarchs of the Jewish religion, the 12 tribes, Judah, Issachar, Naphtali, Gad, Levi, uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, and so on. And Jesus, being a Jew, comes along and he picks how many disciples? Twelve. Matthew, James, John, Peter, and all of these other apostles that were the heads of basically the, ex of the extension of Judaism, which now has become Christianity. And the fact that we believe as Christians that when we die... Is that it? Is that it for us? We just rot in the ground and there's nothing left? What happens after we die? We're going to go, in fact, we're going to go higher than Mount Olympus. And we'll be higher than Zeus. And I don't know what all the other names were. Apollo, Aphrodite, Hephaestus, Demeter, Artemis, Ares, Athena, Dionysus. We'll be higher than all of those. In fact, the apostle, I think it was Paul, said that we will be judging those gods. We'll be judging angels. You believe that? Say amen. So what did some of these gods look like? Take a look at this. These are called the Igigi. That's a funny name, isn't it? What's the first thing you notice about these gods? What's the first thing you notice? Their eyes. Their eyes. You can tell here, let me step over here. You can see here, these gods here, 
and what looks like where they came from. Looks like a disc hovering it in the heavens. There it is there in case you want a different look at it. Um, here's another one. In fact, you look at these. Notice the odd big shaped head, the big eyes. And then notice this one. You see this God. He's actually doing this. He's waving. This is actually part of the, who know, who's ever heard of the Nazca lines? Nazca, Peru. Okay? Nobody, nobody knew this for thousands of years. That there was drawn into the dirt in the desert, Nazca, because it never rains there ever. And there were these lines that were made into the dirt and nobody knew they were there and what they meant until somebody back in the late 20s, 20, 1927, somewhere around in there, flew over there at about 10,000 feet with an airplane and actually saw that these lines made figures. They saw a monkey, they saw a spider, they saw a whale. And then on the side, what you are looking at is the side of a huge mountain where somebody carved into the side of that mountain a giant figure of a god who looks a little bit like these gods with like a universal sign of, hi, how are you? Welcome. Okay? That's been there for thousands of years. Nobody knew it was there because they couldn't fly 10,000 feet up there to see it. Now we know it's there. This is one of their gods. And who does it look like? Yeah. See, Steven Spielberg, he's been researching UFOs and aliens all of his life, too. And he had the, the script of a movie written up, always wanting to do something with it, but never, no, no, no movie production studio wanted anything to do with it. Nobody, he didn't have the money until he made Jaws. And after he made his millions of dollars off Jaws, they said, you can make whatever movie you want. And he makes Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is really the first time we ever see, because everybody thinks of aliens before Close Encounters came out, everybody thought of aliens as little green men from Mars. And Spielberg said, they're not green and they're not from Mars. They're gray. And they have big bulbous heads and they have weird almond shaped eyes. And that is how he designed his aliens in 1977, 1978. And nobody had ever pictured aliens like this until Spielberg did it. He had done his research, hadn't he? He had done his homework. So when he designed what he has called his favorite character of all time, the E.T. from the movie E.T. It just happens to look like, just accidentally happens to look like some of these ancient gods. I don't believe it was an accident. I believe it was on purpose. And what did this E.T. do to, remember this finger lit up, right? What did he do to little Elliot at the end of the movie before he's going to go back up and by the way, th think about this for a minute. The story of E.T. is this. A god is up in the sky and falls to the earth. Dies. And three days later is resurrected. And then ascends back up into the heavens. Have you heard that story before? It's a mockery of Christianity. And before, see before Jesus left... He promised his disciples that he would send them the Holy Ghost that would show them things to come. Well, this E.T. takes his little illuminated finger and touches little Elliot in his third eye and gives him enlightenment. 
He says, I'll be back. That was my best E.T. imitation. <laughs> I should get $50 extra for that one, all right? How about this one? Does that look like, the one, especially the one on the right, does that look like some of the descriptions that people have given of seeing these aliens, these large heads with these almond-shaped big eyes? And they've all said that these eyes were just jet black. And the people that have seen them, especially the children, said that they always did everything they could to not look into the eyes of these aliens that they were being abducted by. Because every time they looked into the eyes of these aliens, images and scientific knowledge and things began to be poured into their mind. And it was going in so fast that they couldn't keep up with it. And it was hurting them. They didn't like it. There was in Zimbabwe in the 90s at an elementary school called the, uh, I think it's the, Ar the Ariel Elementary School in Zimbabwe. The teachers were having a meeting inside. Some of the uh, cafeteria people were watching the children in the playground, 100 children in the playground. 62 of the children watched as the silvery craft landed in an area called the bush. It was right outside of where they were supposed to go. They were not, not supposed to go out in that area. And it landed in that area, and three little gray child-looking with big heads, big black eyes come floating out of this ship and was actually looking into the eyes of these children, giving them images of... Things like the end of the world and how the world is going to all burn up and, it's, and technology is evil and, and we're hurting the planet and, we need to, and you need to do something about it. And these children are in, they're probably 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. 62 of them all reported the exact same thing. It caught the attention of Dr. John Mack, who was a Harvard psychiatrist, Pulitzer Prize winning author. He flew out there himself to interview to see, number one, if these children were lying. He took a film crew with him, filmed them as he interviewed them. He had them draw pictures of what they saw. And he comes back and he says, I don't know what to think about this. These, number one, these children, they're not hallucinating. They're not lying. They saw something that they didn't like. And they said that when they looked into the eye, the black eyes of these aliens, that it all put images inside of their heads. And none of them liked it. And to this day, those children now are adults. And not one of them has recounted their story or recanted their story. Not one of them. Here's some more. I'll move through some of this a little bit quicker. The gods, notice the wings. Wings always represent the ability to fly. We see that in the Bible. In the parable of the seed and the sower where Jesus said the fowl of the air comes down and eats up the seed. But then when he gives the interpretation of the parable, he says... The wicked one or Satan comes and takes away the seed. So anything that has wings is an image of or an idea of something that flies through the air. These images here carved in the stone looking almost identical to the images that people see now of what they call gray aliens looking like children. These are the Japanese dogu, these little idols they are only about this tall represent some of the gods that they claim to have seen years ago their ancestors here's another one here's some more uh, let me move through these here these this is nearly the same thing um, in China this is the images of their gods notice the eyes it's all about the look a eye always look a eye some of you will get that joke later same here with the eyes, same here. In fact, 
uh, there on the right, I believe this is Aboriginal artwork. What did they see? The same thing, I believe, that people say that they're seeing now. In India, these gods came in chariots, flying through the sky, hurtling dangerous weapons at one another. There is actual evidence on the ground in a place in India, I can't remember where it is, where the physicists have been there and said, we don't know how it happened, but at some point, a nuclear explosion took place here at this site. They know it for a fact. All of these gods having chariots, flying in chariots. Here's more of them. The god Apollo is a sun god who draws the sun across the sky in his chariot. Did you know that the Bible mentions chariots of the sun? And God told his people, he ordered them to destroy them, destroy those chariots of the sun. In fact, most cultures have this idea of the sun being carried across the sky in some form of conveyance, usually uh, a chariot with the uh, Hindu the uh, the those from India they have these flying machines called the Vimanas they depicted chariots of the gods flying through the heavens able to go anywhere at almost any speed in other words they were very very fast here's some more of these Vimanas this was discovered don't even ask me to pronounce Chhattisgarh, I think, in India. And they drew pictures of these gods that had descended down in that area. And again, the similarity to what people see now as far as what they call aliens is pretty striking. Ancient artwork. This is called paleo contact artwork where you see saucer shaped or UFO shaped images in early paintings here uh, this picture didn't come out very clear but it looks very similar to an ancient painting of a UFO in Japan a few thousand years ago people up the the uh, eastern coast of Japan they all described the same story a saucer shaped craft came up from the ocean landed on the the beach a Blonde-haired, beautiful, non-Asian-eyed woman came out of the saucer carrying a box, speaking in a language that nobody understood. And the, those who had seen this and recorded it for posterity by drawing the artwork, they all drew the symbols that they saw on the side of whatever craft lady landed in and there have been reports of UFOs especially one encounter at a military base an American military base in England where a craft landed had almost the identical hieroglyphics on it we're going to take a break here in a minute in this case here the one who painted this particular artwork of the Madonna uh, Mary Apparently, he saw a UFO in the sky and he draws himself staring up into the sky at the UFO that he saw. More chariots, more chariots, more chariots, and so on.